Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Okay, Pathfinders. Pathfinders are in an interesting spot now. Mm -hmm, very much so. Have you been playing them the whole time, Voyan? Pretty, pretty much, actually. Uh, when Intercession dropped, I kind of switched over to them um, for a little bit and was trying them out uh, and really enjoyed trying an elite team for a little bit. Um, and then I flipped back uh, pretty, like, just maybe a couple weeks before the Data Slate update that kind of made the Recon drone viable again. <laughs> And kind of uh, spurred them back to closer to their former glory. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's pretty close. Yeah. Now they're. I mean, it's not quite ignoring heavy and uh, having twice the you know AP two grenades, but. <laughs> yeah, that part was pretty broken. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Canada at some point, probably towards the end. I do you have like the list of upcoming Canadian tournaments that you guys want to shout out? I have just the one, um, the like RGT at our local store here. Um, yeah. That's going to have both Jason and George that you've had on here previously. So, all right, so that'll be a good call out. And uh, are you ready, Jason? Oh yeah, recording has already begun. All right. Well, we want to make sure that we're calling out Turn Zero Gaming. Thanks for the support on Patreon. You know, our one of our few Terminator support levels. We really appreciate the support. We're here with Voyan today from Canada. Talk about Pathfinders, a near yeah. and dear team to me. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah. The Pathfinders, yeah, a little bit diminished with this most recent data slate, but I kind of thought that it was insane that they got the recon drone for free in, like, end of last year when that happened or beginning of this year when it happened yeah i mean it, it was uh, it was it was definitely a big change uh having come back to them after a while of not playing them uh and it felt really <laughs> i won't lie um but i honestly was still taking the recon drone when it was two operatives uh when i was kind of trying them out so it just felt like a net buff for me it was great it was Pretty much just a net buff. I think yeah. I generally took the recon drone in more elite matchups where you could just really pile on the damage with a well-timed fusion grenade on turn one. And Absolutely. now, you know, you can still do it. It's just not going to be nearly as reliable, especially because marker lights don't work on grenades, something that I feel like a lot of newer Pathfinder players tend to miss. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that grenade has become all... Uh, since playing, since the, the data slate update, uh, it's it's become a lot less reliable at killing. I mean, it was never super reliable at killing elites to begin with. Four dice on threes, four, six effectively with AP2 is pretty good against 12 wounds, but not really good against 14 wounds. Absolutely. And I just mean with the uh, decrease to the recon drones uh, analyzability, it's just kind of now it's ever, it, you know, I'm rolling more ones and twos, it feels like, than ever before. And I can't do much about it. Yeah, I think the Grenadier tends to be hard to set up a bonded play on turn one anyway. So even if you were to get the analyze and it tends to be just the one reroll, whereas the Grenadier is usually yeeting himself up pretty far. So he can't get the three inch bubble for bonded. And I feel like a lot of the times on turn one, people play safer turn ones, So it's harder to get bonded bubbles up to be useful anyways on turn one. Yeah, for anyone that doesn't know what bonded is, that is when there are two pathfinders within three inches of each other, they give each other a single reroll. And robots do not give the auras, but they can receive the auras, which is really nice with the recon drone. It's a fun little combo because it has Ooh. ceaseless and it can get one and it can get balance, basically. And if you have a marker light, it gets, you know, two rerolls plus ceaseless, which basically makes it relentless. <laughs> Yeah, very, very strong. Um, yeah, I don't know. I find with turn one, it's I'm definitely the one to play stage here. And turn two is where I just really explode. Uh, really abusing bonded, uh, for sure. And yeah. 
yeah, generally walk us through what you've been playing for your turn one, turn two, maybe turn three strat- strategic level choices, because there are a lot of things that you can do with Pathfinders like that. Popping the turn one Montca early has been a thing that people have done historically for a long time. I don't generally think it's been the best idea unless you're going pretty crazy and everybody is going on engage you're hitting monka right away you're gonna kill as many people as possible you just run up the mid board and just delete as much as possible most people don't really give you the room to play like that especially on the north american boards where heavy tends to be scattered about the mid board pretty pretty liberally yeah i absolutely agree uh for me turn one it's it's very i'm not popping anything uh i even before this recon sweep change uh, that we saw, uh, I wasn't using it turn one unless it was into the dark. If I'm playing open, uh, I'm not really spending anything. I've got my two guys that are shooting from silent with my marksman and my blooded, uh, staying in some nice, uh, nice spots where they can kind of keep watch, uh, on conceal and in a nice safe position. And they're kind of my damage dealers on turn one. Uh, if I do get some lucky shots or somebody wants to peek out onto a risky objective that only has light cover, you're getting five marker lights and you're getting shot up. Um, and then turn two, I'm typically doing Bonded and Monka, and that's kind of my damage dealing turn. My strategy has usually been to just go really safe and then explode turn two, hopefully wipe out as many models as I possibly can, go kind of even on uh, primaries and at the very least. Uh, and then turn three, it's just kind of cleaning up what's left, what has survived, if anything. So, Yeah. Do you have any big strategic level plays for marker lights that you're trying to set up i know that a lot of boards nowadays have visibility is pretty restricted on pathfinders i found that getting those turn one marker lights has just been much harder at least in this last year of me playing them on and off compared to the previous years where there were you know boards were a little bit more open how have you felt about the meta right now have there been new terrain sets that you feel like have influenced your play that have made it easier to do the turn one setup uh, we, well, I would, yeah, I mean, the, the WTC terrain, that Bandua terrain, we just kind of got into the store recently. Um, and so we've been trying that out quite a bit. Uh, having some of those kind of blown apart windows, being able to see through, uh, has made it a little bit easier. Depend, again, depending on the terrain, uh, it, it is really tough, as you said. Um, uh, our local meta, people have figured out, you know, the less that I can see them, the better chance they have against me. Otherwise, they're usually tabled turn two. Um, it's, I find keeping my high intensity marker lights, um, the, the gentleman that I equip with high intensity marker lights, um, safe and kind of, uh, waiting for my sequencing to have them at the end of my activations or near the end, just before my heavy hitters are, uh, can activate is, has been kind of my biggest success. Um, cause then everybody's kind of moving out. They've already activated and they're stuck there getting marker lit. Yeah, I found that to be generally how you want to lay out your first turn. You want to have your heavy marker lights as late as possible. As far as getting people to come out and engage with you a little bit, have you found any good tactics to like get people to draw out? I know in the past I've used recon sweep on turn one to try to pretend like I have blast threats and then just kind of split up afterwards. Obviously, this is something that you could still do on turn two. You could pretend like you're going to give your opponent a big blast and your opponent can set up for it because everyone's on conceal on turn one and then opening of turn two you split up and now suddenly the recon is everywhere so those are things that i've done in the past to kind of get people to jostle around a little bit how have you what have you done to try to set up these marker light plays on later turns because generally i've found hitting on fours is not great if you can't get marker light set up so if you're not at least getting two re-rolls on bonded it's pretty hard for your 12 dudes to actually do anything yeah, a hundred percent. The the hitting on fours is is brutal. So getting those three marker lights is crucial. Um, I find that kind of I try and shepherd my opponent at times. If I'm overloading one side, um, but keeping the grenadier on the opposite side, kind of the the weak side, if you will, um, it keeps a nice threat where they either have to deal with the overloaded side, and then I'm making plays over there because my marker lights are stacking, or uh, I'm getting these cross map niche visibility spots where you're kind of seeing just a tiny sliver of somebody um, because they're pushing that weak side um, and then you're just able to rack up those marker lights and make sure that you're hitting on at least threes or better so do you do the equipment combo where you stack a heavy marker light and a targeting optic on either the blooded or 
I think the transpectral is the other one that stands out to me. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably, there's no reason to do it on the leader really because she mm -hmm. is pretty reliable as is, but stacking that four equipment points on a single dude, letting them camp out on a building. And that makes the blooded quite good against any of the five up save teams generally, because now she's hitting on twos with the reroll and she strips cover. 100%. Um, I actually opt not to stack too much equipment on one guy. I'm usually taking five high intensity marker lights. Uh, I'm always leaving the climbing ropes at home. I'm always leaving the targeting optics at home. I find if I'm putting too much equipment and too much emphasis on one guy, it becomes a big target. And if that target goes down for whatever reason, uh, I'm now in a lot of trouble. And the high intensity marker lights, in my opinion, are much stronger than the optics just because those marker lights are benefiting your entire team. Anybody from kind of one of your regular dorks um, to your rail rifles that are so infamous, they're benefiting so much from those marker lights. Whereas the, if that guy with the targeting off that goes down or he's activated, that's it. You've lost that and you can't use it anymore. All right. So you're really trying to make sure that you're spread out so that you can get as many marker lights out as possible. And then hopefully the Monka turn with bonded and double rerolls is giving you enough oomph to push yourself over the edge. Absolutely. Yeah. And just focus those key targets. If you can get kind of the scariest operatives from each opposing kill team and focus them down with marker lights, it's either you're either getting rid of them with your shooting or you're doing enough psychological damage, as I like to call it to your opponent, where they're thinking, oh, man, I'm stacked with five marker lights. I really don't want to poke this guy out to do anything. And it really messes with people enough that you can usually start to get some pretty good board control. Uh, what do you do for tack ups? Uh, my so my I love the killing blow. <laughs> I'm a big Monka like through and through. Um, so and I just my turn two um, kills always go through really well. Um, so I, I love taking that as my faction tack off. Sometimes it's mark enemy movements depending um, if my opponent if I know my opponent likes to play KG or it's a team that will play KG uh, and will not give me shots such as the new uh, Jaegers having that super conceal. Um, you know, being able to mark enemy movements on a few guys is a lot easier. Um, and then with being locked into recon only, uh, I love to take the recover item, uh, depending on the map, uh, secure vantage. And then if not secure vantage, then I'll actually take, um, uh, career. Nice. Yeah. I mean, those sound pretty reasonable to me. Being able to make sure you're killing your opponent, killing blow, the big counterplay. I don't know if anyone realizes this against Pathfinders. I'll give you guys a, a little tip. If you guys are struggling with Pathfinders, if they take killing blow, just kill them. They are five up save models and you can generally just shoot them and they die. You can't give away that secret like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the funny things back in the day when intercession... I think maybe the first nerf had come out. I played a game where my opponent went all engage, and I actually found myself struggling quite a bit to manage manage things on turn two. So, like on the second turn, he just double tapped and killed two guys, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get the second point for killing blow. It is it is really tricky. I do like that it's based on a wounds characteristic. So if you're playing like against eight wound uh, teams like Kazakhin. Um, being able to just trade equal kills, but having that wound characteristic carry you over the edge or killing a big model or a couple big models and then forcing your opponent to really double down on killing you uh, can sometimes be overwhelming, especially if you're killing those guys that haven't activated yet. Like for intercession, like you said, if you're killing an unactivated space marine, uh, that's one less guy that's double tapping you. So, Yeah, it's really that half of your team has to be on engage. So you've got to be very careful on turn one when the Pathfinder player is trying to set up something to get killing blow killing blow on turn one is very hard killing blow turn two and three generally doable but you can put yourself pretty pretty far out at risk and if your opponent is just killing engaged models and leaves your concealed guys in the background sometimes you're just not legal to score absolutely yeah that requirement to be more than half not just half uh more than half engaged is is killer sometimes it definitely hurt me in the beginning of playing pathfinders but as i've kind of played them more and more they you know, you just figure out, well, if I'm trading one for one with you, usually that's a winning winning situation for Pathfinders. We just have so many models that we can trade up super easy. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the drone choices, I know this is uh, often discussed, but generally I don't actually think there's really too many choices. There's the shield drone, the marker drone, the recon drone, and the gun drone. And those are like the four that you should probably play in some combination. Again, the heavy marker lights that you said you want to take five of, the, heavy, the marker drone flies and also gives gives a spot. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, it's really for me, I trim the fat. I go to three drone choices ever. Uh, I've never really enjoyed the shield drone. Uh, I found I've had just as much success with running gun drone, recon drone, and uh, marker light drone. Having that marker light drone on elites, I like having because you really want higher quality shots rather than volume of shots because those three up saves um, will prevent you from punching that four or five damage through. Um, so having the sixth high intensity marker light is just amazing. Um, but that gun drone is such a such a frustrating piece for a lot of people because you get fly on an operative with relentless that benefits from marker lights and just gets up in your opponent's face and that four or five damage is no joke like three normal hits takes out a space marine that's incredible well a 12 wound space marine not the inner chomps. yes yes sorry <laughs> yeah as far as the teams that the gun drone is better against it's better against worse saves so five up saves it's generally excellent right because mm -hmm. you're putting Gen, the floor is eight shots. You miss all of your first four shots. You roll again. Out of eight potential dice, you're almost always going to get a crit somewhere. And sometimes you get two. But as long as you get like a crit and a hit, generally you're doing injury at least to a seven wound model, mm -hmm. which means that he's trivially doing a ton against that card, blooded, any of these other five up save teams. And when you have the drone controller, you can just have him overwatch and do it again. And the math really doesn't change all that much between hitting on fours, rerolling everything and hitting on fives, rerolling everything, because you're probably going to get a crit somewhere and all you need is the one crit to land. Absolutely. No. And that's usually my gun drone is usually into kind of the more horde teams or elf teams. Um, just because it is that much more of a threat that they kind of have to deal with. Yes, he's not doing objectives as reliably, but it's such a strong killing piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my experience with the shield drone has been into those same teams. So generally, when you don't need the marker, you can have the shield drone for the turn one secondary medic function where he's protecting a bubble of a couple models. And then you put them on engage, you charge two vet guard troopers. And now the vet guard troopers are confused because they're not going to kill the gun point. drone. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so that's generally where I found success. And especially if you set up that turn two blast trap that vet guard like to look for, you can cluster up on the side and then recon sweep them out. And now suddenly the shield drone is forward. You can charge a bunch of dudes and just like, well, you've got to you either fall back from the drone or he's got a five up invuln. And, you know, he might hit you once. No, it's true. One hundred percent. That's actually I had not considered uh, using the shield drone in a more offensive way like that, but it's true. Disrupting enemy pieces like that is fantastic. Yeah. And one of the fun, cute things that you can do is you can marker light people in engagement range. So people who try to charge you to lock you up, you can just put the marker lights on them and <laughs> blow them up afterwards. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. I, I, a lot of people forget that it's just visibility and it doesn't specify anything else. And I found that that was the a big trap as well is just you know people think they're safe in melee from you and then you've got that one ploy that's letting you shoot into combat as well as just stacking marker lights you're never really safe from pathfinder gunfire yeah i think pathfinders generally have remained one of the most fun factions for me because they poke, poke my brain in an interesting way where i get to deal with guns and moving and positioning and you have a lot of tools like reposition saying that you get a dash through engagement range does mean that there are some small cases where you suddenly are in a spot where your opponent it's like a mini barge it's not quite barge but it can kind of function like barge in some cases absolutely <laughs> yeah the grenadiers got some fun tactics i know that pathfinder players generally have like a list of tactics in our heads that you want to go through the grenadier going first you know, to do a grenade run now is not nearly as likely, but grenade grenadier going last now is probably generally going to be how you use them, right? You run up, you threaten the fusion grenade on any of the midline objectives. You check the grenade and then you're standing on an objective or you're close to someone else. And then you worthy cause and you yeet them up into the next spot and you chuck the EMP grenade and do two big hits. That's kind of a generic strategy. I know that we mentioned the gun drone, but you probably have a couple other strategies or tactics that you like thinking about and using. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the Grenadier is absolutely the, the, exactly how you mentioned it is pretty much how he's run for me, uh, running him last. He's either staying on concealed to get a really safe uh, setup for a turn two uh, worthy cause with that guarantee uh, activation. Or, um, or like you said, he's going fully aggro on turn one and getting those big hits. Um, for my other plays, it's, I often am running my, um, my blooded in a nice vantage point. 
Uh, I find him better than my marksman. Running the marksman as kind of a just another rail rifle that's running around uh, with a better hit has been way more successful because the blooded just already being up in advantage, being able to marker light and then shoot while concealed and just being able to use those action points effectively has been great. Running the marksman in advantage, which I find a lot of newer players like to do because they think, oh, it's the sniper. He's got to be somewhere uh, where he's got advantage. You shoot, and then it's kind of, okay, what do I do with this other action point? Like, I, I'm kind of stuck doing nothing. There's wasted wasted talent there. Um, whereas if he's running around, you've still got a silent operative running around the board that's able to do massive damage, as well as, you know, putting him on engage and then having that AP uh, lethal five mortal wounds punching through is just fantastic. Um, as for other other combos, I love running my transpectral. Uh, running, messing with people's APL if I can to seal objectives out from under people because a lot of people forget that yes, he's the guy that shoots through obscuring all the time um, but being able to modify someone's APL, especially against elf teams that don't really have a counter to that, they have no ploys to really counter it or uh, comms to really overcome it, it can be really damaging and just being able to contest a little bit better has been just awesome Yeah, and that would work really well against Nemesis Claw as well because I don't have any answers to that. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had, I've had great success against a few of our local guys that like to run Nemesis Claw. And it, again, you think of Pathfinders as a, as a shooting team, not something that's going to have really a lot of control aspects to it, right? But then there's always the one guy that forgets about it, and it just is so damning to that big play that they were about to set up and uh, mess you up with. Yeah, I mean, Pathfinders have historically been very good against elites <laughs> and that yes. probably has not changed against nemesis claw because they get to use obscuring which pathfinders again just ignore <laughs> yes <laughs> it's uh yeah i'm uh, jason one of our local guys who's and uh, has been on the podcast talking about phobos he hates running his phobos into my pathfinders because the smokes are useless is not obscuring guys they can get shot back just as easily as soon as i'm stacking those marker lights um it's yeah it's been rough so <laughs> I think that brings me to the last big pivot point on Pathfinder players around the world. What guns do you use? Are you using ion rifles, which are five five dice hitting on fours, four five or five, yeah, four five AP one or you know hot, and five or five six AP one hot or four five P one basically. Those are the two separate profiles. Or the trusty rail rifle, four dice on fours, four four mortal wounds two lethal five. P1 or AP1. I mean, looking at the at the map, uh, I've always loved uh, rail rifles are just way cooler anyway. But I always run rails in every matchup. The and looking at the map for most teams, there's very niche scenarios that I found that uh, the ions actually better. It's been rails kind of coming out on top. That lethal five mortal wounds just breaks up a lot of breakpoints very easily. And the fact that you're getting up to three rerolls basically relentless uh, on some of those guys and being able to crit fish very easily has been just like pulling off some crazy plays getting four crits against a custody uh is just like really fun for my side to, to do it was really rough for the guy that i was playing with in one of our tournaments so to punch through what 14 uh 24 damage i think after all the math's done um is just incredible with a rail rifle and then always having that ap1 uh without having to worry about hot has been just great yeah, I've always been a proponent of ion rifles just because if you land the five hits, it doesn't matter what your opponent does, even against custodies. Generally, you know, they're if they're saving on fours, they're probably not going to get hit. The problem is that nowadays setting up that getting up to ballistic three three has been much harder unless you are doing heavy marker lights and targeting optics on your ion rifles. So I have come down a little bit on them. I think the incidence of Felgor and now Commando's bigger weakness to crits has meant that I have opted towards rail rifles a little bit more than I would have in the past. Whereas when the game first came out, yeah, they'll just land five hits and I don't really care what your dice are because you're going to take a floor of 15 damage. Yeah, it's there was uh this actually all is kind of ties in with one of the questions that I had is Pathfinders a one box team or do you absolutely need more models than what comes in the box to be competitive? I mean, I've had great success with running them as a one box team with just running uh the rails um and then building uh my recon drone and the gun drone I and uh 
I, I can't remember, you know, uh, Travis, you might have a better idea because it's been a while since I've built them a long time ago. I can't remember if you can actually build uh, the marker drone, gun drone, and recon drone all in the same box. Um, I believe can, yes. it's two normal drones, a recon drone, and 10 guys. So I think it is a one box team, if I remember correctly, because you need 10 yeah. in big 40K and you need the recon drone in big 40K. And I think you get two drone options normally. So I think think that's what the layout is but i don't 100 percent remember because <laughs> the last time i built them was when they first came out <laughs> yeah same, same here it's been since child off so it's kind of i believe that it is a one box team if that is how it is set up at least for me because i'm not taking that shield drone um there have been guys that have mentioned you know don't glue the the drone bottoms on and then just swap out the drone bottoms uh kind of similar to magnetizing operatives in which case it is totally a one box team yeah i think against specifically the marine teams having the iron rifle threat of all right you've come out you've killed one dude and now you have enough marker lights where this iron rifle will always delete you is good enough where eventually you probably do want the option of your two iron rifles you've got roster slots you might as well have the extra options but if you did want to just play whatever guns you built and that's like your entire setup you could absolutely do that in one box i think and it definitely means that pathfinder is one of the better budget teams i remember part of the reason why i bought them to begin with was when the box came out they were dirt cheap on ebay and i got my set for like 35 dollars and then i mixed in like crute and human models over time to get my greater good fix in because that's why i got into tau when i was a kid back in the day yeah, I mean, the models are fantastic. I, I, The other problem I have with realizing if it's one box or not is I already have a lot of Tau models from being interested in them in 40K. And it's funny, my, my first venture into Tau was, you know, at the era when Triptides had first kind of become a thing and nobody wanted to play with Tau players. So I didn't actually start with Tau. I ended up buying another team because I heard nobody wants to play with you if you're playing Tau. And that's kind of rung true again in Kill Team, funnily enough. Uh, <laughs> how oppressive Turns our team out. is. Yeah. Turns out that people get into Warhammer not for the guns and the bolters, they get into it for the chainswords. And everybody thinks it's fine to chainsword each other up, but nobody wants to get shot. And that has remained true in the US. I believe elsewhere in the world, I think looking at the WTC maps, people have become far more comfortable yeeting dudes out to get shot. But not really in the US. <laughs> That's fair. Um you know, we've had a couple teams that have popped up in the last couple years that have made Pathfinders a little bit harder to play, Felgor being probably the easiest one. But I think back in the day, Commandos and Novitiates were always relatively hard matchups for Pathfinders. How have you found the arc of difficult matchups over the last year and a half of play? Um, I definitely, like, Into the Dark has always been an interesting one. I feel very comfortable uh, on it since... Um, since the drone buffs and being able to have the doors being opened, but it's still such a nightmare for any team like commandos where they just don't really need to flip to engage. They're just ready to, to come get you from conceal. So it does make that matchup pretty nightmarish. I think still, even after all of their uh, nerfs that they've received uh, and all their adjustments, they're still terrifying for me on, uh, on into the dark maps. Same with Felgor. Um, in novitiates, uh, we had a player come to one of our tournaments. I don't have a lot of experience playing into them. There's not a lot of guys in our local meta that like to play them. Um, but they definitely gave me a rough time. I played a little too cagey and their ability to just basically deny you the ability to get those shots off unless you're uh, able to kind of fork two operatives, um, which if their, your opponent's placing correctly, it can be very difficult, um, makes them a, a nightmare to deal with. So because okay, there's a couple harder matchups that have existed throughout time you know felgar are one of the new ones but commandos and officiates i think for me have always been historically kind of not the easiest or have presented a lot of problems i think vetguard also are one of those teams where all right well we can kill one to one but they got 14 so if we go one to one we'd lose so we got to figure out a two for one somewhere you know in those matchups We've got a good we've got a good couple tools. Vetguard specifically, they gave us the gun drone, which is always remains an insane threat against the five up save teams. And against Novitiates, Blinding Aura is just the most annoying thing in the world. And you know, I again at LVO, one of Canadians finest, George, he got me pretty good. I had totally forgotten the play against Blinding Light, just because I hadn't done it in forever. Tell us about some of the tools that you've used again some of our more annoying matchups or if you have another annoying matchup outside of novitiates vetguard commandos and 
uh, Felgor that you want to bring up? Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's actually really funny you bring up George because uh, we play with him quite frequently at our local store. And uh, last tournament loss that I had uh, was from him with his novitiates uh, doing exactly the same thing where you forget and you play a little too cagey and that's kind of kind of it. I think, yeah, for, making sure you're forking those operatives and, and being able to kill two is, is kind of what you need to do. Uh, and that was a lesson that I'll never forget from George. Um, but yeah, it's there's... There's a few difficult matchups. Uh, I mean, you've mentioned pretty much all of them. I find Into the Dark the scariest for Felgor and Orcs, just because with Orcs being, like Commando specifically, being able to push up uh, in Conceal, not really needing to be in Engaged, and being able to get up in your face, uh, even and because there's so much heavy around, you can't use those five marker lights to your advantage to get those shots off, and you have to get close to pull those shots off in cover. Um, makes them very scary still, even after all of their adjustments. Uh, and Felgor just requiring that crit to put them down makes your rail rifles all the more pivotal uh, to to get rid of them. On open, it's a little bit easier, especially if you can get some shots off uh, turn one um, and get some get some frenzied goats going. But uh, yeah, they they are a pain in the butt on uh, Into the Dark for me for sure. Um, and the old kind of elf teams like Harlequins, those guys were a nightmare for me being able to fly over and have a, an operative with a Grenadier that has three APL that can move dash, uh, throw that grenade into a nice cluster of Pathfinders that I've had um, has been rough. And that has cost me some tournaments or a tournament at, uh, at a point just because, you know, he managed to, what was it? It was a charge, killed my big recon drone and that charge managed to put him in enough of a, a distance to get another three pathfinders three or four pathfinders with uh, that prismatic grenade so definitely a rough matchup now that they've been nerfed they're a little bit easier to deal with but i think that high mobility high lethality is still still scary but if we're trading one for one into those elven teams it's your pathfinders are going to take the game every time so that's kind of what you try and do is limit those asymmetric matchups into into uh into the elven teams yeah pathfinders been generally pretty good against elites and anything that they out activate by a fair margin and uh, personally i've basically never i don't think i've lost against void dancers yet on pathfinders even throughout the, the entire two and a half years that i've played the team just because at some point they gotta go touch a button and if you go touch a button at some point you can overwhelm that first guy and then it's 12 to 7 oper activations and then it just snowballs very quickly normally it's very true. I, I remember that game very well and having some very cheeky shots where I just couldn't get a three up uh, to save my life, even with rerolls. So that's probably why that loss went through. But uh, yeah, him killing a third of my team in one activation was really bad. That was, again, me being a little bit newer to Pathfinders um, at the time uh, and coming back to them. But, you know, it's it is what it is. You take the losses. Yep. You learn. I've learned from you it. Gotta learn. so that's, you got to pick yeah. pick yourself back up. And Pathfinders, I think, unlike a lot of the other teams, really are not very forgiving to learn. No, absolutely not. And I, I often shelf them if I'm doing a teaching game. Um, and I try like not that I'm discouraging people from joining the greater good. But if a newer player kind of says, I want to try this team, I tell them, be prepared for a headache. There's a lot of guys I play against that are like, wow, I really need to try Pathfinders. And it's it's not the auto win that it seems. There's a lot of thought processing that goes through that. And, and the sequencing is so critical to that team's success and positioning. It's just, yeah, it's not an auto win. Uh, I know a lot of people hate hate the Pathfinders right now. It's probably one of the most hated teams. Um, but they, they the really most depressed the class. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not as easy a win as everyone would like to think that they are. There is a lot of thought that goes into it, you know, tooting our own horns here a little bit, but <laughs> it's, it's a hard team. Like the fact is your guns do nothing until you do three other operators worth of setup. And if you don't do the setup, you really aren't that scary. You have to know when to pop your buttons. If you pop your button and you don't get anything done, you have lost the game like if you only kill two models on the turn that you want ka against another similarly sized team you've probably lost because the next couple turns you're doing recon which means you got to move up the board get into positions and all you're doing is running around not firing your guns because you do need that turn to really do a lot of work absolutely and we're only valid in shooting like it's that melee is not good three dice on fives two three damage like that's not and our leader and our blood are a little bit better but that it's it's not great. Like the 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 leader with bonded, 
or sorry, we want with bond with uh, balanced on his knife and hitting on fours, a little bit better survivability, right? But he's not killing anybody. That's not happening. <laughs> so you're setting up for shooting. And sometimes that means getting up within two inches to bunker somebody in cover. Um, and if that shot doesn't go through, you're getting punished heavily. And in any other matchup, you're not like shooting is so such a safe action to do. You flub the roll. It, it requires an entire action to respond. If you flub the roll in melee, which Pathfinders ultimately always do, um, you're, you're just dead. That's it. It doesn't matter if the, if the normal hits are doing two damage, three damage or eight, like it, you're dead. There's all these dice coming through. It just ruins us. So. Yeah. A hard team that really is not very forgiving to learn early on. You will lose a lot, but there are probably some tips that we Kev both said. I know early on, we talked about the late Grenadier play. We've talked about the gun drone, getting an overwatch early, being in a really aggressive position. Those are two very important things. I'm sure there are some other tips that you felt were useful early on. You want to lay it, lay it out for the Pathfinders before we switch over and talk a little bit about the Canadian scene? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think for me, the, the biggest thing is, is setup is so crucial. It's kind of and with our changes to recon sweep and, and the alpha strike not being as worth it as it used to be um, and kind of as big a risk as it is, it's kind of setting up on turn one is probably most important for this team uh, and if not more important than most other teams um, and just making sure you're getting those marker lights. The quality of shots has to be there. You're, there, you're four or five damage, sure, but you're not killing stuff if you're not having those marker lights on and making sure that you're focusing and counter both counter deploying and counteracting um, key operatives for your opponents. So if you can identify uh, the, what your opponent's key figures are, that's what you're trying to get rid of. You want precision shots into hard targets. And as soon as those are gone, you're having a much easier time. Like for example, if we're looking at Felgor, you're getting rid of the, the gong guy uh, and frenzying him so that you're able to then just deal out those crits and punish those Felgor players a little bit easier. Um, if that's if that's something you can counteract really early on, you're having a much easier time for the rest of the game. So I think it's uh, the big play is thinking thinking a few moves ahead and treating it a little bit like chess. You're trading some pieces every once in a while, but you want the the you want to trade up and you want to make sure that you're getting rid of those uh, those high threat figures from your opponent. Yeah, another example of like a critical piece is against Novitiates. If you can land a shot on the Cup Girl and delete her, the game is much smoother. And that's a generic thing against all Novitiate players, but for Pathfinders specifically, because you are a shooting team and Blinding Aura is such a pain in the butt, you really do want to snipe the girl. Because if you snipe the Cup Girl, suddenly the Blinding Aura that you double tap costs you two faith points and you still get a kill and it's fine. And because they'll run out eventually. With the Cup Girl, they probably won't run out at all. No, it's true, a hundred percent. So, and and then one other thing I'd like to add too is just make sure you have board control. Like that's a that's really important. A lot of Pathfinder players that I see that are newer because you're shooting, you're not wanting to push up the board. You're wanting to keep that distance. That will hurt you. You will not make up the distance. We're very fast. We have a lot of tricks, but it will hurt you if you're holding back too far and you're sitting too far back on turn two and your opponent's outscoring you on primary. That's it. Yeah, the turn that you Monka is the only turn that you have the movement to go make sure that you're on the next level objectives past the midboard. And if you have no no threats on that, your opponent can basically just lock you up on the midboard, blow up your dudes, fight you, trade off, and then on the following turn, you're now stuck on your backline shooters, no one in the midboard, and there's no way for you to get the midboard, and that'll be the end of the game. Yeah, yeah, and it's a feels bad. Um, I wanted to add one little bit extra stress to the uh, importance of the quality of the shots. Um, if you, for example, like see a target of opportunity and you're like, oh, if I don't shoot now, they're going to get away. But you don't have any marker lights set up on it. Um, you're kind of just really setting yourself up for fail. Because if you shoot at something, you get a bad roll. You've pretty much like traded that operative because now you're on engage. So like it really, really, really is important to like stick with the process like get your marker lights no, out there. Make sure that like your your killing hits actually kill. I think there are some small notes depending on what a, a quality shot looks like, depending on the yeah. save and armor type of your opponents. For example, against Blooded, Vetguard, Brood Brothers, who are save up on fives. If you have a marker light that is a heavy marker light and a pulse rifle attached to it, and you drop two marker lights and take a shot with bonded, that's four dice on fours, four five with two rerolls. That's probably actually good enough to be considered a good enough shot, especially if it's on a good target. Yeah, like if yeah, you definitely. if you tap the leader on Brood Brothers when you land three dice and they have no cover save, they're probably dead. Yeah, agreed. 
Agreed. And I really think, you know, you, you want to follow the, that Talva uh, art of war. You, you're going to be Cal Yun, really. Like you're following that patient hunter uh, the first little bit, and then you're unleashing with Monka. Uh, and, yeah. and just don't don't ever take uh, Cal Yun art of war. It's just the benefits just don't. <laughs> don't there's there's like exactly Monka. one matchup in the past where Cal Yun made sense, and it probably might still make sense against Wormblade specifically, but that's pretty much the only spot where I would ever consider taking it. And that's you start everybody on engage you play loot or secure or some other mission against Wormblade where they want to come out and shoot you you have everybody staged up on cover you pop Kalyon and you say all right come and shoot me I'll, I'll save twice and then i will nuke you out of existence every time you shoot me yeah and that's pretty, pretty much the only time that i would use it <laughs> otherwise i would never i would never take Kalyon. i tried it at nova last year i did some cagey stuff on in the dark or I played around doors but you know ultimately if i had the extra dash it would have been better <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's too versatile. It's basically, it feels a little bit more like an extra APL. You're, you feel a lot like the Void Star Corsairs. Like, it's just, it, it's great. Mm. That actually leads me into bringing up Determined Technician. I know you've mentioned in the past that you've used it a little bit. I've only used it the one time, and I didn't love it just because the two CP is a lot to spend. But tell us about the game where you did it and why you did it and how it went. So and Determined Technician, actually, for anyone who doesn't know, is you get a six-inch bubble of Monka or Kalyon one more time the turn after you use it. And I'm pretty sure it's even more restrictive where it actually additionally requires visibility, and you can only use that free dash from Monka if you're within the six-inch bubble when you use it. So it is super restrictive for 2CP. It's the, I don't know, Travis and I have already said this is the, the floor that nobody uses, <laughs> but I have used it twice in two games. Uh, against the same opponent, Jason, uh, who's a who was a big Phobos player and is now scout player, who's been on on the show before. Uh, wonderful player, excellent like strategic mind, and, and just is able to mess me up consistently. Still, he's my biggest opponent, um, and it's it's just, it was in the scouts recently, and it was just I had four guys left. They're all clustered. They they need to spread out to do some objectives still. Uh, it, I got he got some massive blasts into me uh, using his tracker from the scouts. And, uh, it was just, you know, I need to get that extra distance. I need to still kill some stuff that's left because we're kind of even on models, but I need to still score primary. I needed that determined tactician. So I spent the last of my CP to use it. It actually ended up working out We you know, the greater good took the win, uh, but just, and you know, every time he, he makes fun of me, he's always like, you use the one ploy nobody uses and it only ever works for you. So. I mean, if you're down, if you're down at the ninth and there's nothing left in the tank, it makes it makes sense if you've got four to four and you need to gamble a little bit i think this is something that i do in magic the gathering when you're trying to think about what is the only way left for me to win it's not going to be me standing around and shooting and not moving so i got to get the extra movement somewhere what tools left are there in the belt just determine technicians this thing that's never going to get used but i got to do it i got to do it and something in magic is like you'll think about all right there's six cards left in my deck i've got 20 cards left i have a one in four chance so every turn you're drawing it's like all right that one in four chance has gone down and you're playing for your outs Pat, kill team definitely has that element too especially when you're down to low number of, of operatives on both sides you can think about what your opponent can do and what you need to get done and that you know it sounds like a perfect time to use the term tactician especially because now you can tease jason as much as you want oh 100 and he's never gonna live it down because now it's immortalized on this podcast <laughs> Um, and you had said that you've played a little intercession as well. I'm curious, uh, as like a slapshot overview, if there's any parallels that you would like to shout out there. Honestly, I loved playing intercession because it, it elevated my game so much. Um, I recommend it highly to new players and, and even to experienced players to take some time and play the team because really it, it, they play the base game better than anybody else. And I found the shooting can be very oppressive. Uh, especially if you're putting the right attachments on and you're running the right uh, weapons. Um, but the the positioning is so key for Pathfinders, and it's the same thing with Intercession. It's If you're not pushing up the board, you're in trouble. If you're taking reckless shots, you're in trouble. It's just like the the fact that you had to have so many guys on Engage and you have to position them in ways where maybe you can get non-reciprocal shooting by making sure that they're obscured or getting rid of a few key operatives here and there that will do big damage to you. 
I found in that way they're very similar, and it, it, it that was the that was the biggest turning point for me in Kill Team and in kind of elevating my game was just learning the grassroots of the game to to such a high level that I'm not thinking about it anymore, and it's just nonstop. Uh, my positioning is only helping me; it's never hurting me. And barricade placement it falls in that 100. percent So, yeah. Um, did you have like a, a steady loadout that you would always take or would you like swap your operatives around based on the matchups, um, like equipment so I, that you'd always take? I, I had a standard loadout that I ran. I, I still think that the shooting is, is superior. You're not taking chip damage when you shoot somebody and the fact that you can shoot twice um, and potentially get out of dodge or just move dash and shoot um, to get some critical shooting out that you need to. Uh, I would always run the uh, intercessor sergeant with a um the blessed bolts uh and the auto bolt rifle hitting on twos re-rolling ones four or five damage incredible and being able to shoot twice into hordes that was a dead operative pretty much every activation um and then i would run two guys with bolt rifles uh with the vengeance class scopes so you're having a p1 um lethal five so you're basically getting ap1 according to the math um especially if you have that balanced re-roll it's really solid um, and then, uh, just a normal dork, uh, intercessor, um, and then the intercessor gunner, of course, um, and the, uh, the assault intercessor grenadier. Uh, and he was kind of my one melee threat because I wanted to get him close up anyway, because he has grenades and I want him to use them. So that was kind of my standard loadout. I actually brought it to NYO, um, last year, which was, you know, that was kind of my first big tournament. So thank you guys again for running that and my uh i'm kind of still butthurt about it though because my very first round was into adrian um and i wish the guys at my store didn't tell me they're like you're playing one of the best players in the world first round and it just totally shot my nerves and i played the worst game into adrian he probably doesn't remember me at all or he remembers me as the guy that just gave him a ton of free points with his orcs on that first game i don't even think i scored double digits on points it was horrid it was just absolutely a mess so adrian if you hear this i did tell you i'm coming back to burn down the white house uh just like we did years ago so you know be be watching for me i'll be at worlds so i mean you're gonna come to new york open this year too right i would love to i mean i really would it's all gonna be up to the girlfriend if she lets me go and uh you know she i I spend a lot of time so we'll see i have we you know there's some big tournaments coming up so i would like to i would really like to i had a great time uh the year before and, uh, you know, if I can come and embarrass some Americans uh, some more, I would love to do that. So <laughs> true. You know, New York is home to one of the only player to go out to another country in the U.S. and steal one of their tickets. Yeah, there, I think there was no Canadians at Worlds the year before because of that, because our only ticket was came up, stole it from Ottawa. And the guy, I don't think even went um, to the tournament is no true. Went, true went. Oh, he did. OK. Yeah, well, yeah, that he makes went, he went. a little better. At least he went. But like, yeah, he didn't. You know. He didn't steal your ticket and not go. He's up there. Okay, okay. Because I was gonna say, you know, I, I'm still a little butthurt about that too. So, yeah. and that for, was for anyone who doesn't know when the New York Open is, you know, October 26, 27, we'll have tickets up hopefully in the next week. Actually, hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, and we'll try to make sure that everyone can come because it'll be, it'll be a big one. We're bringing 40k in this year, so more reasons to come through New York best u.s city in the world (laughs) (laughs) but you know obviously the canadian scene has been popping off this year between the second place or was it second place vivek at uh lvo yes second place yeah Yeah, uh, second place at lvo obviously you guys have a couple golden tickets this year going to the world championships for sure this year no one came and stole the only tickets (laughs) and you know we've had jason on here and george on here in the past last year and now we've got you voyan and actually, we, we just went to Montreal very recently for the podcast. So talk to us a little bit about your upcoming GTs. I know you mentioned that you've got one coming up, and I'm sure anyone in the Canadian area might want to know. Yeah, if this, if this is coming out before the 13th and 14th, you better show up. Uh, come on down. It's uh, Chimera Gaming, uh, one of the best stores I've ever been to. Those guys are fantastic. Thank you, TJ, so much, the owner. Uh, and, and James, James, you run incredible games all the time and incredible tournaments. Keep up the good work. He's just the whole other level of, of professional and exceptional at running games. Um, if you want to go to a proper, proper tournament, even just our usual monthlies, he's running them at such a high level. So this, I, I can't wait for this GT. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be 13th and 14th 
uh, down here in uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. So if you can make it, come on up. I challenge some of you U.S. guys if you can, you know, do some last minute arrangements to get up here. Do it. Uh, we're happy to have the competition, and uh, you're going to have some some strong players coming out. There's going to be myself, Vivek, and uh, our buddy Alex, who all have golden tickets. So there's going to be some good competition there. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm really excited. I can't wait for it. Yeah, and you're you're uh, 13th and 14th of July. Yeah, so this Correct. will come out in time. So for anyone who doesn't know, now you know. Get out there. Go crush some heads. Uh, do you guys have a, a golden ticket for this one since it's your we large We sure team? do. Yes. It's a golden yeah. ticket. So, I mean, if you want to come try and steal it, go for it. But you've got some stiff competition. We've got, I mean, Jason needs one, and he's gunning for it. He's been practicing real hard, so... I was going to say, if a lot of the stiff competition already has golden tickets, then uh, that's your chance, folks. Yeah, there is quite a few golden ticket holders. I think there's three of us total that'll be there uh, for sure, maybe four. Um, but yeah, it's so you do have a pretty good chance. I mean, if we all place uh, and, and you're under us, then you kind of get it automatically, right? So that's generally how it's gone. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. So, Pathfinders, a little bit of intercession. Obviously, Jason is was chomping at the bit to talk about have you ever put all 10 equipment points on your one dude and seen <laughs> see how it goes yeah the, I, i've heard of that the doom guy loadout is what some of the guys here call it and it's just it sounds like a blast i really need to dust off my blood angel intercessors and and try it out i mean what have i got to lose now right um but yeah i mean i i've heard good things i've heard horrible things when he gets nuked and then it's kind of now you've just got a bunch of dorks running around so I played him like 20 games in a row and he died like one, one out of like 20. The real secret is you use him last and you send out five dorks to go get shot first. <laughs> just, yeah, so the chain, he just hears it out. Yeah, the chain swords steal everybody's points and then trade their lives for like one or two kills. Doom guy literally kills half of the team because he also has an auspex so he can shoot through obscuring. He can take some really safe shots and just like snipe a couple things here and there like one of my games against void dancers like my opening shot was i move auspex scan and then kill the lead player with the fusion pistol just like sniped him through like a crack in the wall and uh you just take a bunch of crazy non-reciprocal shots like that and then like when once people are like uh, the enemy team goes engaged to deal with all your chain swords then you line up a overwatch on someone and then you uh and shots on two other people and then in one turn he'll get a triple kill um so like even if most of your people are are fighting with their chain swords you still use devastator doctrine um he shoots with a reroll kills a dude shoots with a reroll kills another dude it cycles back for overwatch and he kills a third and then the one that he's got overwatch on is someone that's already activated and then they just like can't escape doom guy's wrath and uh they can't shoot back at him and you're always going to get the overwatch and it's uh it's extremely effective and like there's not anything in the game that he can't kill like in my in my game with him against the the tyranids he killed all three warriors in two turns it's like 55 wounds worth of big bugs so now i feel like i just have to that just sounds like such a great time like i so okay so you know here's what's gonna happen we're gonna do that uh jason george i expect you guys to give me a run for my money against the doom guy and uh we're gonna see what happens but i'll keep you guys updated on uh, how that works out I definitely I need to try it now. That sounds fantastic. And now I have the good tips straight from the pro. Yeah, it's extremely fun. Highly recommend it. Uh, champion swing by the Discord. Yeah, yeah, swing by the Discord. Anyone who's ever tried it, <laughs> you make sure make sure to let Jason know because Jason's been out here championing it for so long. And I do. I, we've watched it at LVO. It did work. Part of the reason why Adrian won and Vivek got second is because Jason was out here tying Vivek's game. <laughs> yeah. That's All right, incredible. Bowen. Yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast, talking about one of my favorite teams, Pathfinders, the near and dear greater good. Yeah, it's been great having being here and just, you know, having the opportunity to talk to somebody else who's uh, playing Pathfinders at a high level. It's it's kind of rare because a lot of guys put it down or are just put off by the fact that nobody wants to play with you. So, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks again so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Long time listener and a big fan and happy to just be here. Yeah. yeah thanks for coming on man yeah I'm glad to have you i've been i've been also interested in hearing more uh more about pathfinder so here we we finally have it and uh yeah thanks yeah thank you and thanks again listeners for swinging by